G'day. How are we all? So I would pop on again today because I uh, I've made a resolution to podcast far more frequently and I thought, well, I'm going to embrace the oral tradition, as it were, of uh, storytelling, particularly in Ireland, by not writing anything down. Oh, to be fair, I very rarely write down stuff for my podcasts. Of course, I do research and things, but my podcasts are always um, done more or less improv, stream of consciousness, as things occur to me. And um, I thought, well, if if we were still in the tradition, which is still ongoing in most parts of Ireland, however, they don't put a huge crimp in things, if we're still... Um, if we're still in the tradition where people gather around a fireplace and tell stories in people's front rooms and that sort of thing, as they did of old, um, then you sort of, uh, it's not just listening. You're also watching the storyteller perform. It's like a live stand-up improv performance of stories you've heard before, of myth, of legend, of personal adventures. And... Um, now that everyone's sort of vlogging or Zooming their podcasts, as it were. I mean, people have been streaming for ages and ages. Now that we're all doing that, um, people are becoming more used to... People becoming familiar with storytellers as, I don't know, like that children's series, Jack and Ori. Do you remember? Jack and Ori was a, an English children's TV series in which um, a camera crew would follow around like one narrator telling a story, um, a treasured old story, or my particular favourite, and I didn't see it until I was an adult with kids of my own, um, was Fat Tulip, that um, TV series with Tony Robinson, you know, he of the Time Team and Blackadder, and um, loads of things because he's you know, very clever. Um, Tony Robinson's Fat Tulip, in which he just told these wild, fantastical stories about inhabitants of a little English cottage and a garden. Um, just him telling a story without actually having to like animate the little characters of the story or whatever. It was just all about him telling the stories which he'd written. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, for those of you who wonder what I look like, for those of you who um, do listen to my podcast, so perhaps you might like to see me um, on video. Documenting my thoughts and my, you know, my adventures on video as much as um, via podcasts which are out there on Spotify and stuff. Um, yes, I, um, I podcasted most of 2020 during the pandemic with Mr. Owen Corgan, who is um, uh, rather famous on this island of Ireland. I shall get to him in a little bit. The reason I titled this vlog, this podcast, however you want to frame it, um, Mrs. Doyle's teapot, is <laughs> when I was a young mum in my mid-twenties, in the 90s, living in the country of my birth, Western, <laughs> in Western Australia, in Australia, country of my birth, in a little town called Donnybrook in the southwest of Western Australia. It was named after, it was named for um, a suburb of Dublin, which is nowadays very posh, um, but in the days that it was... Um, in the, day, in the days in which my hometown in Western Australia was named for Donnybrook, um, it was known only as um, so a little village on the outskirts of Dublin where there was an annual fair, agricultural fair, in which everyone got hella drunk and 
beat each other's brains in and that's how you got the term to have a bit of a Donnybrook because after the the infamous brawls following the Donnybrook Fair annually. Um, somewhat not coincidentally, perhaps uh, the footy team in, in Donnybrook, the AFL football team in Donnybrook, my hometown, um, their, their reputation precedes them. So having a bit of a Donnybrook, believe me, the Donnybrook footy team used to strike fear into the hearts of their neighbours. And it's just like, you know, it was just like, well, to have a Donnybrook is to have a fight, you need to watch out for the Donnybrook football team as well. Hilarious. Yeah, there was, there has always been a fuck ton of Irish Celtic foreboding foreshadowing in my childhood and formative existence. I lived in five houses just on Emerald Street alone <laughs> in, in the town of Donnybrook in Australia, named for an Irish uh, suburb. There was a street called Emerald, the Emerald Isle, of course, street called Emerald, and I lived in about five houses on the same street at various points and uh, even lived in another one on which in the old survey ordinance maps was known as Shamrock Street. <laughs> So perhaps it was always inevitable that I would marry um, men from Irish stock. First time I married an Australian boy who was of Irish stock with a very Irish name and ginger curls. And there weren't many of them around in those days. Um, and he gave me five children, which was very Irish indeed. And, um, and then... I was widowed and 10 years later, nine years later after I was widowed, I married an Irish backpacker from Dublin. And that's how I ended up now, of course. But back when I was a girl in my 20s, in the 90s, in a little town called, in a little town called Donnybrook in Australia, there was... Um, a series on the television called Father Ted and not many people in my town were really into it but I thought it was the funniest thing ever um, and of course a legendary Irish comedy that was of course made in England because Ireland wouldn't fund it um, and I, I just loved it but <laughs> very, very few other people in my circle sort of like got it or liked it very much, but I adored it and uh, it, became a, it became a thing. Oh, God, fuck, I love Mrs. Doyle and I accidentally, I had this habit of um, adopting other people's syntax if I spend time with them and you know, you know how if people, it's not uncommon, that's the reason there's catchphrase comedy, you know, how many people like to remember, what's her name, Catherine Tate, do I look bothered? That sort of catchphrase is like, and you just say, like, everyone, all the 15 year old girls on school buses, you just hear them for like the next year and a half. Do I look bothered? Do I look bothered? Like, even though it's like probably 15 year old girl that the comedian first overheard saying that in the first place, it sort of like becomes this aerobarous of like self repeating catchphrases. Like, you hear one kid say something, you satirize them on television, and next thing you know, every other kid who hadn't already heard the first kid, is now repeating that first kid's catchphrase. First kid very rarely gets the credit, of course. But anyway, so Father Ted was amazing. I loved it. And I, used to, <laughs> and I had the DVDs in the early 2000s. And um, it was the first time um, an Irish boy spent the night with me um, when I was living in Perth, in Western Australia. The next, um, the next morning he was like, he was leaving and he saw like my DVDs of Father Ted and he said, do you like Father Ted, do you? And I'm like, yes. And I was really nervous about that because I thought, oh God, I thought, is he going to say, that's the most racist fucking bullshit stereotypical thing written by the English about Ireland ever because it's so fucking stupid. Like, 
and said he said because I didn't know I didn't know much about anyone who'd written it or whatever I just loved it and uh, but I knew that it'd be made in England because Ireland hadn't funded and uh, and instead he said can I borrow this can I borrow this <laughs> and I was like it's like, uh, yeah, sure, sure, you can borrow it. And uh, next time I saw him, I'm like, so where are my DVDs? He said, still got them. I'm like, yeah, obviously you still got them, so where are they? And he's like, well, I put them on and, like, everyone was watching them. And <laughs> this guy said, and one of them said, like, fuck, dear, she's not getting them back. I'm like, oh, excuse me, she fucking is getting them back. I have them back, thank you very much. But, like, but that was um, my first indication of how much the, the Irish also loved Father Ted. So, fast forward to 2016, and I end up accidentally emigrating to Ireland. Now, I didn't know it at the time, obviously. I'd just come up to Ireland with my second husband, the Irishman, who was from Mayo parents, but was born and bred in Dublin and uh, with our child, the female, the Dublin. Um, so I arrived with the female to uh, live in Ireland for a couple of years whilst I sort of like flew back and forth to England to have liposuction operations for lipedema, so the fat disorder which I suffered from. So it was basically just going to be a base while I had the operations to regain my health and wellness. And while we were here, the female was going to um, brush up on his plumbing credentials because he was a plumber. He was going to like work with his work with his brother's plumbing company in Dublin. And uh, and then a couple of years we go back to Australia. He would be um, he'd have his um, have his like contractors set and everything would go back and would be uh, a happily little settled people in, in Australia while he was like being a plumber and I was wanting to get back home with my family and friends and things having like I had my lipo um, restore my health and wellness instead we ended up sort of staying through one thing or another not entirely my choice quite obviously because um, <laughs> my friends and family as I said are all back in Australia so I'm still, I find myself, on this fecking island, as Father Jack and Father Ted will say. So, but you know what they say, um, make the most of the situation you find yourself in, because um, we always have a choice for how we cope with sudden change to our plans, you might say. Um, and so being an island did afford me the opportunity to sort of meet people from the mystical land of Irish comedy, um, which I never thought I would get the opportunity to do when I was in my mid-twenties in Donnybrook, Western Australia, watching Father Ted and wanting to be a comedian in Ireland. But thinking at that point in my life, there's just no way I could ever get there. I wanted to, obviously. Um, I wanted to be a comedian ever since I was three. More specifically, I wanted to be an Irish comedian ever since I was three because I used to be allowed to stay up very, very late watching Dave Allen <laughs> on television. Um, uh, and Dave Allen was formative. He is the reason why I am very outspoken and uh, sardonic, perhaps, um, about particularly with reference to the Roman Catholic Church and people who conform to religion, um, but sex and, uh, you know, just, uh, he's, he was formative, as I said. Um, now, you can say that Dave Allen was, you know, a, a, probably like a sexist and, um, and there was very much lots of camp comedy in which you would be uh, portraying homosexuality or the LGBTQ community as... Less than, 
but at the time, really, it was just sort of revolutionary to acknowledge it and talk about it and acknowledge, you know, that they, the LGBTQ community existed and were living amongst the rest of society. Um, and it was sort of part of the old sexual revolution in the late 60s, the early 70s. So mistakes were made, shall we say. There was lots of very much, you know, secretaries being chased around the desk by boxes sort of humour. Um, but as you know, there are bosses like Harvey Weinstein who do chase people around desks and sometimes they unfortunately catch them. So this is talked about and we're evolving. It's how we talk about it as comedy evolves and as more and more voices are added to the mix and humanity progresses. It doesn't mean we throw out everything from 1970 saying what was written by a white male, so that's the end of it. We just have to look, look at it in context and then add, you know, alternative, multicultural um, LGBT voices, for example, to the mix. So, Dave Allen, a wandering Irish comedian ever since it was Dave Allen, right? <laughs> and point of fact, I have the unveiling of something later on which will make Dave Allen fans laugh, I hope. Um, Irish comedian, wandering Dave Allen, and then I grew up what it was like. Always wanted, I was a kid that always wrote the sketches and the skits on the like the school camps, and um, I was like, you, you. I wrote funny stories, and I was like the newspaper editor of, like, of the school when I was like 12. But that sort of, I was a theatre nerd, one of the team, that sort of thing. But then, as is what happens to a lot of young girls of my generation, um, I got married when I was still high school age, basically. Got engaged to be married when I, should, when I was literally like a high school dropout. I should have still been in school, I got engaged um, in um, a relationship which was not healthy and seemingly un inescapable at the time because of the lack of resources afforded to like little girls in dreadful, dreadful situations like that generation and there's more awareness and there's more resources now but there are still many many women not of my generation still of my generation but not just of my generation in those same present circumstances today but there are more choices thankfully nowadays than there were for me um so my daughters, for example, have managed to get into their twenties with um, no husbands or children whatsoever, and they still have a great deal more choices. Um, you like my two oldest daughters, anyway. I still have one. I've way to go, but she is, wants to be an astronaut. She doesn't want to be a mummy. So there you go, human progress. Anyway, always want to be an Irish comedian. Um, but during most of my um, most of my youth, my life opportunities and choices were limited. I did what I could. I still went out, I had a couple of kids, and then I went back to uni. Um, while I was at uni, I had another kid, but I just went and I breastfed in uni lectures. Like my oldest daughter was 16 days old when she went to her first filmmaking lecture because I wasn't going to like let it stop me. It was just like I knew that like people can still do it. I used to read. <laughs> Because I was a voracious reader as a kid, so I would read um, you know, autobiographies and biographies of uh, people from the theatre world or the film world or whatever, and I would find out, well, you know, when they were 25, they had a baby. However, when they were 45, they were in this film. So it doesn't mean the end of everything, where people used to always say to me, once you have a kid, that's the end of it, it's all over. And it's like, it does limit your life choices, but um, with the right sort of support, people can still achieve great things and you don't it doesn't mean that everyone has it wasn't about being famous it was never about being famous for me it was never about being rich for me I just loved theatre and loved writing and I just wanted to be able to sustain myself doing that and I would despair being forced to you know work in jobs where I couldn't be creative at all and I'm like, have you ever seen that Sopranos episode where uh, Vincent, 
What's his name? He escapes. So it's being an LGBT community. He escapes. He escapes New York and goes and settles in Connecticut with like um, Johnny Applecake. Do you remember? I'm not going to do any more spoilers. Um, but he tries to settle down to a menial work and he's trying not to look at the clock and he's trying not to look at the clock and it's dragging on and dragging on. It's literally mental torture. And you know, it's so written from the heart and it's written by like writers who've experienced awful menial jobs before they got their break writing for The Sopranos, you know, and it just so rang true. Well, that was me in a packing shed watching Pink Lady Apples for export podcast on a convey about it's 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 hell. <laughs> it's just mental torture. It's like because it's oh my goodness. It's alright if you're like time will fly by if you if you're with someone whose company is entertaining, a time will fly past. But if you're just there by yourself, there's no one entertaining to talk to and no way to sort of occupy like yourself with a book or writing anything or whatever. It's just torture watching like things in assembly line fall past. If you're of a creative bent or have ADHD or whatever, I'm not diagnosed, but it's taking an educated guess here. Um, I'm a bit of a fluidity to it when it comes to settling down, except for creative projects that I can pour myself into. But creative projects one can pour yourself into um, a bit thin on the ground in the 80s and the 90s in rural Western Australia and even in the early 2000s. So even though I was doing like filmmaking at uni and I was a journalist when I was 27 through to like when I was like, well, late, my mid-20s my mid through to my early 30s, I was a journalist and reporter and now I just sort of like freelance articles for the occasional online journal. Got a couple of articles in Independent Australia, which is known as the uh, Online Journal of Independent Thought in Australia. And they now are, like, I wrote articles for them ages ago, 2014. That's um, still up there, of course, so their things are online. But now they, um, now they have, they definitely have their cred, shall we say, and they have like, press passes they can go to the Canberra Gallery and write about, you know, you know, they're officially respected, you might want to say, among peers. So, um, you know, there's still places to be published even when you're not specifically working for print press or anything with Murdoch's label on it. Um, there's, always, there's always places to make your voice heard if you try to get yourself out there enough, I guess, which brings me around to getting myself out there, right? So I end up on radio in Tasmania for a couple of years and then I moved to Ireland in 2016 with the Fenian, the Irishman, but I ended up in Mayo and I felt a bit stranded, like homesick, stranded and too upset to actually sort of like write the book. <laughs> Like sit down and just write and in a linear fashion because I'm just so stressed. But I haven't been the strange and magical place it is of positive thinking and stuff. Facebook one day informed me that there was an event nearby that I might be interested in, as Facebook does. It's always a double-edged sword. Like if it was telling me, it was like it's telling me about events I might be interested in that are nearby, which are completely benign and wonderful and, um, you know, just getting to know you. But in America, it's like Facebook is targeting people, I guess, who look like me of a certain, I don't know, social demographic, whatever. They'll let, they'll let people like me know that there's an event nearby that turns out to be a Trump rally or a mega fundraising event or something hideous. It's always a double-edged sword, as I say. Like, you know, fortunately I live in a country where there's um, where the nut job rallies are few and far between and this particular event was 
fabulous and almost surreal and it's I can't believe this is happening to me sort of thing. And it was afternoon tea with Mrs Doyle in a large town about three quarters an hour away from me. Now, for a girl from Donnybrook, Western Australia, who used to watch Father Ted in the 90s when it was on telly, in the days where, like, I was too broke to go anywhere else, so, like, I watched telly because I was just inside generally breastfeeding <laughs> or doing my home, uh, my homework, my uni assignments and things, but I couldn't do much else. Um, and I used to, at the time I was writing in the in the 90s, of course, um, my first husband, the Irish Australian husband, he used to he he loved he loved the idea of Ireland. He felt he very much identified as an Irish Australian before it was ever sort of like trendy to do so. I think because he felt so he stood out with his curly ginger hair and freckles. Um, you don't stand out if you've got ginger hair and freckles in Ireland, believe me. Uh, he stood out because of that. He had an Irish name which no one else had in Western Australia. And um, and he, he was a lonely, like, computer nerd, very clever. And he must have, and he didn't, and he sort of, he moved to Western Australia when he was like six from South Australia, which a very different sort of state than Western Australia as well. So he must have felt that he was just like the man who fell to earth as well. So I think by, he, he used to uh, say to, you know, had the, the dad joke of like, have you got any Irish in you? He'd say, no. He'd say, do you want some? I'm like, but you're not Irish. You were born in Australia. But like his name was very Irish and he had ginger hair and freckles and these three sons and one of his daughters who got like various shades of ginger hair and freckles <laughs> and they're, they're as Irish as the Irish can be that they just happened to be born in Australia like 150 years after the, the first of their lot was sent out there. Oh, there's puppies for those of you who watched my blog yesterday um, or look at other videos on my channel I have several Great Danes and one of my great Danes has puppies at lunch, and that's what we can hear. They're three weeks old, just about. So, afternoon tea with Mrs. Doyle. Three quarters of an hour away from me, and it was just like a fundraising afternoon tea with Mrs. Doyle, played by the magnificent Pauline Glimm, who was kind enough to presumably donate her time to um, a junior rugby team as a fundraiser to come and, like, um, preside over the afternoon tea, which was all like supplied by volunteers, like lashings of smoked salmon and scones and jam and cream and fairy cakes and oh my heavens, the tables were groaning beneath the cornucopia of delight and lashings of tea. It was amazing, and um, and all for like nothing, like cost for all. And it was, I was like, and I was like, this is like one of the most famous. Like we've been buying T-shirts with, like, Mrs Doyle's sayings on it, like the Fenian like, has a hoodie somewhere that says a picture of a cupcake on it and says, there's cocaine in it, which is one of Mrs Doyle's lines from Father Ted. Such is Father Ted, the fame of it. So I went along, I thought, well, okay, I'm going to go along. I can't, just, I, I can't believe this is real. So we went along and we're sitting there, this is in beginning of 2019, beginning of 2019, and although I had, like, wanted to go into comedy and um, and theatre and stuff once I got Ireland, circumstances had meant that I hadn't been able to do anything really terribly creative because um, I basically had no babysitter or support system or funds or um, at, at one stage I did, didn't even have a licence so I couldn't drive myself around. <laughs> and, I had, and I had a kid all the time with me that I couldn't take with me for adult venues or, you know, comedy in, in pubs and things that just couldn't be done. Um, but then this event came up with Mrs Doyle and it was like an afternoon tea on a Saturday. So the Fenian happened to be around on the weekend, so we all went off. 
was for the thing, his birthday surprise, he didn't know what it was, and we turned up. And there we were, and we would like, we sat, at, we sat down at this trestle table full of all this beautiful high tea, and sat there, and, <laughs> and I looked, and I was like, I was looking at my kid who was being grumpy, and then I looked up, and standing there with her hand, on the shoulder of the Fenian, smiling at me with a very naughty twinkle in her eye, was Miss Pauline McGlynn herself, Mrs. Doyle. And I was like, how wonderful to meet you. How amazing. And she was just, she was very gracious and she was lovely. She, you know, she had a brief chat and um, it was very cute. The way she was like handling my man with a naughty twinkle in, the, in her eye. I thought it was, so, it was funny. <laughs> So funny, and the Fenian was like was wearing his hoodie with Mrs. Doyle quote on it, so he was so all excited. And uh, at the <laughs> and side note, in the particular surreal, I can't believe this is happening. Like this could only happen like in the Father Ted episode. At a moment during the proceedings of this charity tea, uh, the charity tea followed by like a bingo call, and which a bingo game in which Mrs. Doyle played by playing with him. Called, out, called the bingo, which was just like, is like, is this really, am I actually really sitting in like a hall by, this, by a river in Mayo Island with Mrs. Doyle calling the bingo? In 2019, this seems very unlikely to me, but yet it really was happening. <laughs> like it was fabulous. But um, as with Lolan proceedings, I took my kiddo outside for a breath of fresh air and because uh, she was getting a bit overstimulated by everything that was going on and we, we took her to outside Breath of Fresh Air and to take some photos by the river and whatever. And then when we came back inside, the Fiend was sitting there with a very silly look on his face. He, like, we'd just, we were sharing the table with like a lovely young couple who had a little baby and they were blown away by, like us, of like Mrs. Doyle being there because they were massive Father Ted fans. But while I was gone with the kiddo outside, um, the f afternoon tea had been being served by um, the junior rugby team players. And one of them came around and it was, there, was like, there was like tea light candles and <laughs> tea light candles among the high teens up. Um, as the kid turned away with this plate of scones and like serving tea, uh, teapots or whatever, um, he knocked like a stack of napkins onto a tea light candle and it went up. The kid didn't know, he walked away oblivious. <laughs> but all of a sudden, the table with like the paper tablecloth and all the like the <laughs> napkins and things on it was ablaze. So it's like, oh. <laughs> It was like smut. It was put out with like a cup of tea and uh, that sort of thing, but not without first everyone like sort of notes. <laughs> noticing that the Fenian's table was on fire, like as though Dougal had been left alone in charge of a funeral at the moment. I'm like, and I got back. I'm like, you can't, you can't be seriously telling me that you set the table on fire while I was gone, like a father, actual father Ted fucking episode. But it was true. Um, the young couple left shortly thereafter with their baby. Good. She was so embarrassed. Poor love. I hope she's well wherever she is. Um, but anyway, at the end of the proceedings, Mrs. Doyle, aka Paul Anglin, who, poor woman, has, I mean, she's never been able to divest herself of Mrs. Doyle, really, like everywhere she goes, no matter what she does, and she's a wonderful actor and whatever. She's just Mrs. Doyle, isn't she, to everyone? Same way poor old Ardor O'Hanlon is like, Try as he might, just can't shake Dougal, can he? As a character from Butler Ted. But um, I mean, once you type class, you type class. It's, it's just it's a thing. It's always been a thing. That's a bit sad. But anyway, the Fenian went up to Pauline McGlynn at the end because Pauline McGlynn crochets tea cozies. That's her side hustle. Is tea cozies, right? And they're called a go ons because Mrs. Doyle's catchphrase, back to the old catchphrase again, go on, go on, go on, go on, as in like, which is the stereotypical Irish mammy um, pressing you to have another slice of cake or another cup of tea or a drink particularly. Gaga, you will. 
Ah, you will now. Go on, go on, go on, go on. Ah, you will. Ah, you will. And it's like, it's really like, and you, you think it's over the top in Father Ted, but then you get here and it's real. <laughs> it really is. And it's awful because it's like, if you it sort of accept, they think you're abrupt. Um, and we try to like, or if people give you something and you say, I'll give you something for it. They go, ah, no, it's fine. I'm like, you sure? I'm like, ah, yes. And like, oh, thank you very much. And they look all offended. You realise you're meant to keep hailing and press something upon them for the next 20 minutes of your life. But it's a, it's, it's a bit of a culture shock once you mob up in Mayo. But anyway, Miss um, Polly McGlynn, Mrs Doyle's side hustle is a go on so they're tea cozies, which she crochets herself. And because they're made by her, they go for quite a bit. They're like 90 quid on the internet or something. And I'd always, since I've known the female, every Christmas is like, I'm like, well, if you'd like to buy me one of Mrs. Doyle's that go on, it's one of the tea cozies that I would like. And he's like, for a tea cozy, you want me? And I'm like, but it's knitted by Mrs. Doyle, that's the thing. He's like, oh. But here we were on the most extraordinary circumstances. <laughs> and I believe in signs, of course as I've said in previous streams and things. Um, here we were in the same, literally in the same room as the legendary Polly McGlynn, Mrs Doyle, and her tea cosies, and it was a charity event. So the Feeney went up and bought a go-on, which came with a teapot, blessed by the very hand of Mrs Doyle herself, and he got a hug from her as well, which made his millennia, and mine, it was so sweet. Um, and I came home with with said teapot and a go on tea cosy, feeling like, oh my goodness, well I can die happy now, I met Mrs. Doyle. How how wonderful. But I also made the joke that's like, you know, this is like I didn't make a shrine, obviously I don't make shrines. But I sort of like put out said this is a very special sort of like special moment for me. I'm gonna put it over there. It's gonna be my good luck sort of teapot. Um because I'm going to I'm going to get into comedy. And I already started, like, had started following the Hardy Bucks and the Hardy Bucks Ensemble um, on social media because I sort of had just sort of got into their comedy and their filmmaking. And as a writer and filmmaker and comedian, I wanted to network. And, you know, collab is so over-fucking-used now. But I wanted to collaborate with, like, fellow writers. I couldn't, but I thought, well, there, be, there has to be a reason that I have a TV series just about written and I've lobbed up in the same vicinity as people who make TV series and I've made friends with them and now I've like sort of got this sign of like an actual in-person like chance meeting with like the queen of iconic Irish television comedy, Mrs Doyle. So I thought I'm going to put the sequel over there and it's going to be like, you know, it's not a golden calf. I don't fetishise it or anything, but I thought that is my sort of my beautiful object, shall we say, of positive visualisation, um, the game of life and how to play it, as it were. Like, I believe I'm going to, I believe I'm going to be an achiever in my chosen fields of writing and comedy. Like, my first Irish Australian husband, as I said, he, I so identified that he said when I was writing in the, in my 20s and the 90s, at the same time, I had this Irish thing, I was watching Father Ted and Roddy Doyle and reading every Irish bloody book. I even tried to give myself a homemade Celtic tattoo at one point, which thankfully didn't work because it was dreadful. <laughs> I had lots of Viking and Celtic mythology books and things. Um, I was completely unaware at the time that any of my ancestors were Celtic. Like, I felt that they were, but I kept being told that, you know, I was basically, like, mad. It was wishful thinking, and I was away with the fairies. Turns out... I kind of felt in my crawl I was right, and I was right. Um, so here I am in Ireland. After my Irish Australian husband in the 90s kept saying to me, just one bestseller, dear, just one bestseller, dear, and we can live in Ireland. Because he really wanted to live in Ireland, and he didn't see how we were going to get here either, <laughs> I guess. But um, the thing was, in the 90s, I don't know if it still exists, if you're a writer or creator or something, you lived tax-free in Ireland. Um, so, like, Colleen McCulloch, the famous writer of the Thornbirds and stuff, she, like, she was so heavily taxed in Australia that she moved to Norfolk Island because of the tax haven. 
And like I think Tim Winton, who is a very famous Irish Irish Australian writer or an Australian writer, he lived in Ireland for a bit and I couldn't help but wonder if it was a tax thing as well. But anyway, Ireland at the time was a tax haven for writers. I don't know if it is now. Um, so my first husband would always joke, just one bestseller, dear. And we didn't know. Just one bestseller, dear. And, uh, and then somehow, age 45, I found myself living in Ireland, still wanting to write and be a comedian after, like, a youth and adulthood of, like, live radio and writing and that sort of thing, but held back with personal circumstances of epic, tragic proportion. And I'm finally here and I've met Mrs Doyle herself, as it were, and then I met Mrs Doyle and within, like, a week of, like, putting the teapot reverently aside and thinking, okay, this is my beautiful object, a positive visualisation I'm going to achieve in my in my field. I can't believe life has presented me with the opportunity to be here. I actually started meeting in person the Heidi Bucks Ensemble, which sort of snowballed to the point where, like, within six months, within six months? Yeah, within six months of meeting Colleen McGlynn and getting her magical teapot, <laughs> as it were, um, I was standing on stage at Dolan's Warehouse with Owen Colvin. Um, and then within six months of that, I was podcasting weekly with Owen Colvin for like the best, well, nearly a year, 10 months or something. Um, and uh, oh, Owen Colvin is currently touring Ireland. I'm checking him out. And he's on Instagram at Owen Colvin Fitness and stuff. He's a lovely chap. Um, and he's on Patreon. Go on and say good day. I'm on Patreon also, you can go and find it, say good day to me too. Um, but Owen Colgan, and I'd also incidentally met like um, his ensemble cast and crew members, fellow cast and crew members, um, Mark Maloney and Three Bucks Left, which now they now broadcast and our vlog on YouTube as Dead Hedgehogs. Um, so Dead Hedgehogs podcast on YouTube channel um, is Peter Cassidy, who plays French Toast on Hardy Bucks, Stephen Kelly, who is Cowboy on Hardy Bucks, and um, Chris Gavigan, who is um, all sorts of things to all kinds of people on Hardy Bucks, uh, <laughs> probably most famously the... Uh, the squirrel who brawls with Buzz on Christmas Eve in the Heidi Bucks Christmas episode is Chris Gavigan. He's a lovely chap too. Um, sound as a pound. Um, so, yeah, so I met all those guys and then I started getting my own comic gigs. And I still can't help but think it all started when I got hold of Mrs Doyle's teapot. <laughs> oh, and to... And I've added to the collection, I have two, like, I'm not a trophy. I actually sound like a serial killer collecting trophies. It's not, it's just um, sort of like funny, it's still surreal to me to have like little mementos of from famous people that I would never have thought I would encounter when I was, um, you know, in, in Donegal, Western Australia, sort of particularly pre-internet. It was like I was, I got online pretty quick. When um, I think I had my first email address when I was 26 in 1996, so I was like one of the first people in Donnybrook to have an email address and a page. There weren't that many people that even had PCs in those days because there was like hardly any internet connectivity and stuff. It was still referred to as the information superhighway and talked about with great excitement, but and and its potential. Um, but it wasn't, it was, it was, well, there was no such thing as broadband. It was still dial-up and stuff. Um, but to meet, so to meet in 2019, Mrs Doyle, and ended up with a teapot, and then podcast with Owen Colgan, the very famous Hardy Buck, um, in 2020. And I ended up with, you'll never guess, I literally had a kettlebell 
belonging to Owen Colgan, which was Buzz. And if you ever watch the watch Heidi Bucks, if you don't already, the first episode is uh, brilliant. But Owen Colgan's character Buzz is very into like fitness and working out and uh, beautiful guns, sort of thing. And uh, he's always swinging a fucking kettlebell or something around to show off his arms. And somehow I've ended up with one of Owen Colgan's kettlebells. I mean, I asked if I could borrow one, and I still have one. I'm permanent borrower, as it were. So I have Mrs. Doyle's teapot, and I have one of Buzz McDonald's kettlebells. And the other night I drove to Dublin to watch the Blind Boys podcast at Vicar Street, and Blow Me Down wasn't his guest, Damien Dempsey, who grew up in the same North Dublin suburb as the Fenian. And, like, the Fenian, before Damien Dempsey was, like, famous, you know, the, the Fenian would end up at the same house parties as Damien Dempsey who'd whip out his guitar as the Fenian says, like, he's the same age as I am, like. I'm like, yeah, I know. He's like, fuck me, Damien Dempsey. And it was like, and the only real song I knew about Damien Dempsey, oh, there used to be a great, <laughs> there was a great video of me and the Fenian on my other YouTube channel, which I've lost because I only had it on my YouTube channel, uh, the YouTube channel um, of us when we were on the radio together um, in Tasmania in 2014, 2013, actually 2013. And um, and Feeney is asking me if I have a copy of a Damien Dempsey song. <laughs> Serious? And uh, I could not help but think about that moment while I was like at Vicar Street looking down like there is Damien Dempsey. Like, I was in the balcony, like, 20 feet away from the stage. I'm like, I completely like Damien Dempsey and Blind Boy Boat Club. I'm like, within 20 feet of me. <laughs> I'm like, what a moment in time. Like, for, um, you know, I want to be Irish comedian slash Irish artist who always wanted to be here. Um, the portents are good, I hope. Not all I have to do is tap my ass about in positive visualisation fashion and get some fecking gigs. I think my 2020 ambition, I want to do one gig in America. Okay, I'm going to get to America and do just one gig. One gig in fucking whatever, in shithole county in wherever. I don't care. I'm just going to do one to say I've done it. My bucket list, one gig in America this year. And also I want to get to the Edinburgh Fringe. And I think I will do it in my travel van. I'll go over on the ferry, sleep in my van and uh, and blog it. It'll be a hoot. Anyway, I've got a plan. It was Joe Biden, I think, ironically, who last, last year said secret to happiness is uh, something to do, someone to love and something to look forward to. I have, I have my family to love, although most of them are far away. And, uh, and, <laughs> an alarm. And something to do is definitely hustle my butt, tap my ass around and get some gigs up in Adam, Adam Ant. I'm back on the, back on the, back in the saddle. And, uh, I'm going to get some gigs and get back to writing comedy ASAP. There you go. In the meantime, I'm going to be trying diligent and blog, if not daily, every second day. So I can hold myself accountable, keep myself honest and on track. But anyway, that's for me for now. I will see you when you got nothing on. Ooh, there we are.